Hello, and welcome to the Science Bloggers Podcast. I'm David Latchman, and this week's guest is Hunter Ferris. Hunter is the host of the music psychology podcast, Sound Appeal, where he uses music theory, linguistics, rhetoric, and psychology to explore why we like the music that we like. So, hello, Hunter. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks so much for having me, David. So, why don't we start? by, you know, telling the audience a little something about yourself and what you do. Let's see. I I teach people to play piano by ear. That's my day job. My uh, non-day job, I don't know what the word for that is, is I run a podcast that presents principles of music psychology in the context of songs that people love. Basically, the concept is what's the science behind why we like the music we like. Okay, so how different is that from, say, the study of music theory? That is a really good question. So music theory is the theory behind what music should do and what should happen if you do certain things with music. Music psychology is the study of what actually happens when you do certain things with music and it's the study of what music actually does to us psychologically that said my show covers psychology music theory neuroscience rhetoric psycholinguistics music psychology sociology i try to pick up anything that could possibly help answer the question why do we like this one song choose any song and you know tell us why do people like it to begin with you know, what elements makes a song likable? All righty. That's, that, that's a big question. So I'm going to take Closer by the Chainsmokers featuring Halsey. There are a lot of reasons why a song can be, a, can be popular, but one of them is that people actually like it. There are a lot of other reasons, but I think somebody must have liked this song in order for it to be number one for eight straight months. This is the second song ever to be number one for eight straight months. That has only happened once before. That's difficult to, I mean, eight months, that's, that's a long time. And now you know why it got so overplayed. Yeah. <laughs> one principle that I talked about with this song is that it never gives you any kind of resolution. First off, the chords, they're, they're chords that never give you any kind of resolution. There's only three type. There's only three chords that ever give you resolution. They're called tonic chords. Two of those tonic chords are never played in the song at all, and one is never played at a point that could be considered an N. So the chords never give you any sense of resolution. There's only three notes that could be resolving notes. They're called tonic notes. Well, one of those notes is used about three times in the entire song. One of them is never used in the entire song, and one of them is only used to pass from one note to another. They treat resolving notes as things that either shouldn't happen or things that should be used to not resolve. Now, most people would hear that and think, well, that sounds like musical torture. And after hearing the same song for eight months, maybe you feel like Closer is musical torture. But the first few times you heard it, your brain started trying to predict what was going to come next. And when our brains start trying to predict what's coming next, we get a dopamine release because dopamine helps us to focus and because we need to focus in order to predict what's coming next. It's a very subconscious thing. I don't think the chain smokers knew that that was going to work, but there's a reason that when they first wrote this beat, Drew Tagger, one member of the Chainsmokers, and Freddie Kennett, another guy who helped write the beat, sat there listening to the beat for hours on loop because they love this beat so much because it keeps giving them dopamine releases because it never gives any form of resolution. As in anything that gives us pleasure, our brain gets used to that dopamine release. And over time, we need more and more dopamine to get our fix or we go into something new to get a new release. So does that play into us liking music or, or, or wanting to listen to music? 
I think that's a great explanation for why songs feel overplayed. If the dopamine release were consistent, if it happened every time the same way, then we would never get tired of this song. But after about the 60th or 100th time listening to the song, the effect is just so diminished because our brains know what's coming. We don't have to guess what's coming next. We already know it. We've heard the song a hundred times. The, the effect gets so smaller that we say, eh, I'm done with that. Time to move on to a new song. Yeah, that makes sense. And if we didn't get tired, I guess we'd have like a number one song for several decades. And that has never happened. I kind of want to ask which one number one song that would be for several decades. I, I don't know if the... There would be a song for several decades. I mean, uh, you know, music psychology and theory is is not my field, but I imagine that culture plays an important part in why we like music. Um, Oh, absolutely. And with that means the generation gap, so to speak. I imagine it plays some part in this, right? So That's a good point. I don't know, is it possible for a song to be theoretically number one for several decades? I don't know. So decades, I would say probably not, except for one big part. The songs that you heard as a kid were the songs your parents liked. And the songs that you listen to trying to feel nostalgic are the songs that you listen to as a kid. And those were the songs your parents liked. You probably like a lot of the same songs your parents did just for very different reasons. You like them because you're in a different generation than your parents. That that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. So your podcast, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about the origin story of this podcast and, you know, how and why did you do this? So I love essays. That's probably the nerdiest thing I ever say. I mean, I really like movies. I really like all the nerdy stuff. It's just essays. That's a little nerdier than normal. Most people don't write essays for fun. But no, I go I go on YouTube and I turn on video essays and I just listen to those for hours. And I got immersed in this field of video essays and I'm thinking, this is so cool. I want to do something like this. Now, a lot of video essays, because of the medium, focus on film. And a lot of them will focus on the art and and on film theory, and they'll talk about what specific film moves should do to the audience. Things like when you do a close-up on an object, it'll signal to the audience that this object is important. Well, a lot of that was film theory. It was, this is what should happen. And I thought, that's a lot of speculation. I don't want to speculate about how the audience feels. I want to be right. I wanted to make a YouTube video essay channel and join in. I have got to release my first video essay, and I'm so happy about that. So I so I figured I'm going to do something like this. The film market is kind of oversaturated. I found some really cool things about music theory as it applies to pop music, and I thought, I want to tell people about this. So I decided to stick to how the audience actually feels instead of how the audience should hypothetically feel. I decided to stick to music psychology instead of music theory. I didn't know music psychology was a field at the time. I just wanted to talk about the psychology of music and then decide, and then figured out later that, that was a real thing. So I wrote out a couple scripts. Sorry, I outlined a couple scripts, wrote out the scripts, rewrote the scripts, went into a recording studio recorded everything, edited the vocals all together, and then edited it together with background music so that people would really get the effect of the song and would really understand how this song works. And then I got burned out. I edited together the audio for three episodes and said, I'm not editing video right now. I'm going to release this as a podcast and not do any video right now. About six months later, I did video for one episode, and I was so happy about that, but it took about two weeks to do that one episode, and maybe later I'll get back to that. As it is, I released as a podcast, and Song Appeal was born. But if I have to say, I'm also a fan of video essays, so people like Nerdwriter is one of the YouTube channels that I watch regularly, and I'm in totally in awe at at what he's able to do, you know, to bring that narrative and mix it together with, you know, video and explain what he's doing. Seriously, he is 
really good at what he does. I know. It's like I want to learn for, you know, just how he does what he does. And and maybe one day I'll, I'll do the same. I don't. But you can tell <laughs> what he does takes a lot of work. And I respect that. So who do you think is listening to your podcast? Who who are you aiming all of this this for? So this is the weird part. My purpose in song appeal is I hate seeing people not being enthusiastic. If you're going to do a thing, enjoy the thing. Get as much as you can out of the thing. And then I see so many people who hate music theory that I think, okay, I need to do something to show people that music theory can be fun and cool and interesting. And that can be relevant, that it can matter to you personally, even if you're not a musician. And that last little bit is kind of one of the big things about song appeal that I haven't been actually targeting this toward people who write music or people who even play music. If you listen through the episodes, you'll notice that not a single time do I talk about the audience as if the audience is a songwriter. I talk about a songwriter could do this instead of you could do this. Because my whole thing is to talk to people who are listening to the music and, and explain this is why the music has the effect on you as you listen to it. Now that said, I haven't been doing a great job at marketing it toward that group. I've been trying really hard. It's just, it's been kind of weird trying to figure out where people talk about listening to music. Usually people don't talk about listening to music. They just listen to music. I've been advertising it a lot towards songwriters and composers, and they've been getting a lot of benefit from it too. And I've, I talk on Twitter with a bunch of music academics and they hear the podcast a lot. It's kind of a scattered target audience. I kind of have two separate target audiences. One is 16 to 28 year olds who grew up in America and grew up speaking English because that way I can talk about culture and linguistics without having to talk about 147 different countries worth of culture and linguistics. I'd really rather just talk about one and... A lot of pop music consumers are from America, so I figured I'd bet pretty sure they're from... I haven't checked that. I haven't checked that. I need to go check that. Okay, so regardless, the secondary target audience is songwriters and composers because they're going to get the most benefit out of hearing what effect music has on people. Yeah, well, it makes sense. I think like doing a podcast is a lot like running a startup. You start out with this hypothesis that, okay, these are the people that are going to buy my product, whatever it's going to be. And you test that hypothesis. And quite often you're wrong. And the people that are going to buy your product is not who you necessarily may have thought about. And I think podcasting is the same in many ways. Sometimes the people you think are going to be the most interested in your podcast are not the people that you imagined. It might be somewhere else, someone else. And I think that's the, the challenge of marketing a podcast. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the fun part of it. We didn't enjoy doing it, finding that audience. Why else would we do it? Well, to be perfectly honest, I am hoping to hire like a PR person, but that's not going to be until way later down the road because I'd really rather get to focus on being the host of the show instead of having to be everything on the show. I can certainly understand that, you know, being everything on a show, it, it takes a lot of time and effort and being able to distribute those tasks would, would be an immense benefit. You know, you, you won't be thinking about so many things at the same time. So I have, I have one final question. It seems like a lot of universities now are using data analytics to, to examine, you know, song sam samples. And one of the findings that they, well, some of the findings that they, they're, they're talking about is that music is becoming less complex or they're not showing that diversity that they showed in the past, or they tend to be louder. Is this, a, do you think, a, a valid way to analyze music? I mean, and I know it's just looking at music theory and not necessarily the psychology behind it, but should we be doing this? Okay, so here's the tricky part. I try to focus on one song at a time 
and dive really deep into that one song because I feel like that'll give people the best idea of why that song does what it does. But sometimes we really do have to compare a certain song to the cultural norms of what's going on. And when you do, you find out there's a lot more to a song than just what it is. There's when the song came out. There's where the song came out. There's who the target audience is. There's the reputation of the singer. Uh, Sorry, there's the image of the artist. There's all these factors that lead to whether people like a song that have nothing to do with what the song actually is. If you were to release, say, Hey Jude by the Beatles today, people might not like it today. Might. Obviously, it isn't released today, so I can't really run an experiment on that or anything, but the point is... The, the point is there's so much about the song that isn't the song itself that data analytics can't tell you everything, but they can tell you some important things. They can tell you what the cultural norms are right now, and that way you can compare specific songs to the cultural norm. If you don't know what's normal, then you can't point out that this song is unusual. And a lot of hits become hits because they because they use the cultural trends and they stick with the cultural norms, but also do a lot of but also do something that's more interesting that makes them stand out from the hundreds of thousands of songs that are released every year. So I guess the, what, what we can say about data analytics is that it can say something, but we shouldn't rely on it exclusively to come to a conclusion. Oh, definitely not. On top of that, what data analytics can usually tell us is what a specific song is and isn't. It can tell us what's normal, but comparing say a normal song from never mind it can tell us what's normal but it can't tell us everything i guess we can start wrapping up you know is is there anything you'd like to say that you didn't quite get a chance to say huh good question good question um i would love to say yes i feel like there's a really big yes somewhere but I can't really think of it unless you want me to like plug my show or something. Well, you can do that. I mean, that's part of the reason I'm, I'm talking to you. Right. You can plug your show if All you want right. to. So you can find Song Appeal by visiting songappealofficial.com or by searching for Song Appeal in your favorite podcasting app. I come up with a new episode about a new song every week. And you'll get to find some really interesting stuff, both about music psychology, about music psychology, music theory, psycholinguistics. But you'll also get to find it in a format that's designed to be relatable to common people, to normal 16 to 28 year olds, whatever normal means. Okay, and I'll be sure to leave links in the show notes. And thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, David. That was Hunter Farris. If you'd like to learn more about what makes popular music so popular, check out his podcast, Song Appeal. Links are in the show notes. And thank you for joining us this week. I hope you enjoyed my talk with Hunter and learned something new in the process. Join us next week when I talk to a new science communicator.